Good evening, everyone. Welcome. <coughs> my name is Sanjita Saxena, and it's my great pleasure as director of the Shabir and Malini Jodhri Center for Bangladesh Studies to welcome you all to the Jodhri Center's Distinguished Lecture with Professor Dan Kamen. Dr. Kamen is a distinguished professor of energy at UC Berkeley with parallel appointments in the Energy and Resources Group, the Goldman School of Public Policy, and the Department of Nuclear Engineering. Professor Isha Ray will formally introduce Dr. Kamen this evening. While Bangladesh has often received little or negative attention, if we look beyond, beyond the headlines to understand and truly appreciate Bangladesh's contribution to the rest of the world, the country's leadership is obvious in a number of areas, including South-South development connections, improvements in child and maternal health, women's empowerment, and primary education, to name a few. These achievements have resulted in the country surpassing many of its South Asian neighbors on several de development indicators. With respect to energy, Dr. Kamen has argued that while most countries were skeptical of solar energy systems, Bangladesh has been a success story in developing off-grid roof rooftop solar power, known as solar home system, which has given electricity to a large number of people living in remote, rather remote off-grid areas who would not who would not normally have electricity otherwise. And I'm sure Professor Kamen will talk about this more today. We couldn't have been more pleased to welcome Professor Kamen this evening because only a few years ago, we inaugurated the Shubir and Malini Chaudhary Center for Bangladesh Studies. The center is, is housed under the Institute for South Asia Studies at UC Berkeley, and it's one of a kind in, it, in the US to create an innovative model combining research, scholarships, the promote of art, promotion of art and culture, and the building of ties between institutions in Bangladesh and the university. In just a few years, we've had more than 20 faculty and students travel to Bangladesh through the center, sponsored 10 faculty-led workshops in Bangladesh, supported more than 25 research projects in the country. Over the last four years, we have supported eight Chaudhary Center fellows, working on a wide range of topics, ranging from climate change, infectious disease, social enterprises, the 1971 war, and improved child development in rural Bangladesh. Just this semester, the Chaudhary Center, in an attempt to understand one of the worst humanitarian crises of our time, has launched a Rohingya crisis working group in which students, researchers, and practitioners will be invited to develop ideas and collaborations to further our collective work related to this crisis. All of this demonstrates our deep commitment to Bangladesh, to showcasing research, to spearheading collaborations, and to training the next generation of scholars in, it, in the study of the country's history, economy, society, and culture. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Isha Ray. She's a professor in the Energy and Resources Group and an executive board member of the Jodhuri Center, and she will introduce Professor Dan. So good afternoon, everyone. It is really a rare privilege for me to be able to stand before you and introduce my colleague and my friend, Professor Dan Kamen, who will be giving today's distinguished lecture. So I've worked with Dan for about 16 years, and on the third or fourth week of my meeting him, an incident took place that made me see, in a sense, who he was. Not what the CV tells you only, you know, the work that Sanjita has talked about, which I'll tell you a little more in a detail, in a bit of, uh, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes, but the way in which Dan works. I met him, it was a faculty meeting. I said, oh, hi, Dan. And he kind of closed his eyes like this a little bit. So I said, what's up? He tells me I'm tired, I'm jet lagged. So I said, where have you been? This is 2002. The Johannesburg Earth Summit had just taken place. 2002 was the year I came to work at Earth. So he's, I said, oh, you went to Johannesburg. How long were you there? He says, 16 hours. <laughs> I felt like, wait, that's actually shorter than it takes to fly. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> but that's Dan. He's everywhere at once, which is what allows him to be, seriously now, the prolific, wide-ranging scholar reformer and scholar activist that he really is in the renewable energy and sustainable energy and sustainable development world. So he and his students have worked on solar systems, wind systems, 
hybrid solar and wind systems at every scale, from the small rooftop systems that Sanchita talked about to large renewable integration into like the Western American grid. So at every scale from a rooftop all the way to the Western electricity system, Dan and his students and his group have done really path-breaking work, which has made Professor Kamen one of the most, I think, arguably one of the absolutely most influential energy and development scholars of the current era. Dan has also had outside university career pathways. He was the first science envoy to the State Department in a different administration when perhaps science envoys may have been more respected <laughs> than they are today. Um, he resigned his position as science envoy in the current administration, in part, I'm sure, because of frustrations with the science, or lack thereof, <laughs> but very much so in frustration with the very muted effect, a muted um, response that this administration had to the uh, neo-Nazis in Charlottesville. So it was a very bold move, and it, uh, I think, speaks to how important the human side of Dan's work is to, to himself and his students. And this is, I think, a very important distinction <coughs> feature that is kind of a role model for our university. So I am very happy to be here speaking, uh, introducing Dan on this very important topic. This is Dan's, I think, you haven't worked in Bangladesh before. Is this your first Bangladesh project? Second, second Bangladesh, <coughs> the second Bangladesh project. And it, he will be speaking not only about Bangladesh's transition to clean energy, but in particular will be discussing the importance of energy systems in the devastating situation in which thousands of Rohingya find themselves. And I will leave you with a small um, thing to read once you've finished with Dan's lecture. In 1997, Dove, Michael Dove and Dan Cannon wrote a short paper on the virtues of what they called mundane science. And it was actually the first work of dance that I ever read. And it talked about the importance not just of major energy transitions, of major technology and technological innovations, which is of course where you know, Dan has been such a pioneering scholar, but the importance of doing this science for extremely ordinary everyday people. And doing the kind of science which matters for ordinary everyday lives on small scale home systems, on improved cook stoves, on safe water where there is no portable safe water, and argued that the university should be taking these kinds of everyday or mundane <coughs> sciences much more seriously than perhaps we do in our current technological optimism phase. So I think the work that he's been doing in Bangladesh and he's gonna speak to us today about are very much in the spirit of that mundane science for the most distressed people in this world. And how can we, as a university and a human community, alleviate their stress by providing or bringing clean water, clean energy, and other essentials to a situation where it's so important not to give up hope. So it's my privilege to welcome Dan to the podium. And Dan, thank you for speaking with us, and thank you for being one of the distinguished guest lecturer, lecturers at the Shubir and Malin Chaudhary Center. Thank you, sir. So those are both so kind that I feel like I could just stop now and just say, you know, all the talking part is done. But I, I want to thank the center for having me. I want to uh, thank the leadership of the center and for all those student and other exchange opportunities that were highlighted, that's really the exciting part of this effort. Um, there's a couple students who have been absolutely central to this work, and I'll, I'll highlight high them as, grow, as we go along. But I hope one of the messages beyond the critical issues of the case of the clean energy transition and that transition in Bangladesh is how impossible it would be to do this kind of work without grad students who really do put it on the line in terms of time, housing cost issues, all of the bureaucracy of Berkeley, and the fact that Berkeley remains where it is, I think is really testament to 
students in particular literally subsidizing not just UC Berkeley, but the UC system with their efforts, which is not how things should be. But it is an amazing feature, and if we can find a way through these kinds of programs to give back enough to, to sort of help the students to both make these projects go and to build their careers, that would be an exciting part of this for me. So I want to thank you all for, for doing this. And again, thank you all for, for coming this evening. Um, I will do a couple things. The goal of this talk is really to highlight how critical not only the evolution of science, technology, policy, uh, and governance is in meeting our climate needs, but how critical role Bangladesh plays. And I find this story is one that gets repeated with, a le with sort of a searchlight that moves from country to country. There was certainly a point when almost all thought about deforestation management focused on Brazil, and there was kind of a n positive narrative for a while. And suddenly we have a change of leadership in Brazil that my Brazilian friends uh, tell me I should look for even worse events than we're seeing in the US. There was a time when Kenya was the unstudied, undiscovered country in Star Trek language. <laughs> and, and, and now almost every international agency has Kenya fatigue. <laughs> because as soon as Kenya went from low income to middle income, interest and spotlights have moved on. And those spotlights tend to move to the most unruly places where rules of civic engagement are the least well known. And so no surprise right now, the popular in place to study is Myanmar. And that's largely because you can do whatever that, where well, I know we being recorded, whatever the <laughs> blank you want there, which is exactly how researchers trying to assist communities in progress should not behave. But that is, in fact, the norm. And excitement moves to the places where you can do the most interesting, perhaps, but certainly unregulated. And that is not actually part of what makes sense to me. Because as you'll see in this talk, the sustainability transition that we all need to make is one where the challenges are not doing things in a one-off manner. You could, after all, at minimum, count 190 countries, plus or minus, there are a few to quibble with, um, we would take 190 episodes. And certainly these episodes are more than one year to get there. And so finding a way to actually build and learn as we are addressing issues in one area and apply those elsewhere is, I think, one of the real critical stories. And so I'm hoping is that even if field work in Bangladesh is not something that you are doing directly, that there's elements of this that apply directly to this transition, Finding ways to support and build careers for students at Berkeley, Bangladeshi researchers and colleagues is a really critical part of that, that overall process. And that's what I'm hoping comes out today. So what I want to highlight is a very brief introduction to my laboratory, because it's critical to think through the kinds of projects we've taken on. And then the second piece will be a bit on not only the energy and climate situation in Bangladesh, of which many of you know more than I do, but also why I actually think that it is the country that is most critical for determining what we do over the coming decade in terms of addressing climate change for a whole variety of reasons. Um, from the monsoon to population dynamics to, uh, to elevation to a whole variety of sensitivity issues. And that will lead into work that I've done with a former uh, student, Rebecca Shirley, and to Kenji Shiriashi. And Kenji is here if you raise your hand. Um, who was critical, who was, was the key author on this piece of work on centralized, not necessarily hard path, just um, issues of the energy transition in Bangladesh <clears throat> on the one hand, and that will lead into a discussion of what um, Isha mentioned, the Rohingya crisis, um, which is the focus of Samira Siddiqui's work. And Samira, if you raise your hand in the back. Uh, who is also critical to the Rohingya Working Group, and I'm going to hopefully see some of the dialogue at the end about the efforts to work there. And while most talks don't end with a really simple set of recommendations, you should always be wary when that's the case. In this case, I actually think that the recommendations for action coming out of this talk are remarkably clear and simple. Not necessarily mundane, but truly simple. So I'm hoping that there's a little conversation around some of the actions that we can do to make some of these, these transitions happen. So let me spend a second just introducing the laboratory. Um, and 
So the laboratory group shifts. It's a fairly large group by standards. And I actually, this is last year's picture because this year it's even larger, I think, not because of topics of research, but because of more frequent free pizza. Um, <laughs> and neither of the students who I mentioned here are actually in this picture, for which I sort of apologize. Um, Rebecca Shirley, who I mentioned, is here. It was Kenji, you, am I missing? No. No. <clears throat> so I didn't think so. Um, but it's an interesting and rather interdisciplinary team, and I would invite anyone who wants to find out more. We meet for lunch every Wednesday in Barrows Hall on the third floor. We do serve pizza. And it's really a working group and a collaboration among students working on a whole range of related topics. Um, I also want to highlight right off that this kind of work would be absolutely impossible and our value would be zero if there weren't groups in country that not only paved the way in terms of opening conversations and validating and valuing what international groups do, but much more critically, the value of this kind of, of interaction is one where you can lose at any point in the sense of bad decisions over dirty or socially unjust power or degradation to human communities or ecosystems. Any single moment can be a moment of dramatic failure. And so all that you win by winning is the need to be continually vigilant. And that sounds like a very depressing recipe, but in terms of academic parlance, it's actually great because it means that if you latch on to a critical topic, you have infinite employment because the need to stay engaged and to support local groups um, like this group here, and you can see not only the, our, our partner and the, and the op-ed that's been passed around, we co-authored together, but also Samira and a number of colleagues that we've worked with um, everywhere from the Rohingya issue to the, to the wider issues of the transition of the overall group. And so any of the materials that you want, um, I always put up a slide to highlight the laboratory's website. Um, and since we're all at Berkeley, it's sort of transparent, but when I give this talk outside, I highlight the laboratories called RAIL, Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory. And if you weren't um, sort of uh, the Berkeley insider community, I would say you need to put in something like Berkeley or my name, because otherwise you'll get the Raelians, and they cloned a human. Uh, they said they cloned a human a decade ago. So that's what it is. And then the Twitter is truly designed uh, to be one tweet a day about the work in the lab. Um, not um, sort of my vacation pictures, I can find those to Instagram. Um, <clears throat> and so if, if you want to follow anything we do, it's all on there, and I, um, I, I put a note about this talk as well. So just kind of one bit of the uh, timeline of our laboratory. I came to Berkeley just a few years before Isha highlighted that kind of fateful uh, trip to uh, South Africa, for which the then EPA Administrator, Carol Browner, asked me to come for a talk, and it was literally 50 hours before a PhD defense, uh, so that 16 hours on the ground actually became nine hours on the ground. Um, but I've been here since. Um, a lot of the work that I did in my transition out of traditional physics was through climate modeling work, and it landed me in the IPCC, which is going to be central to the beginning of the talk. And so we got this wonderful uh, picture, uh, this is a poster um, for contributing to the IPCC, which shared the Nobel Prize with Al Gore. Um, and we've been involved in a whole bunch of science-led efforts to develop new policy tools, a idea called PACE, which simply means property assessed clean energy, so allow property owners to install clean energy by borrowing money from their municipality is something that we developed in the laboratory. California um, is a leader in innovating and deploying energy storage technologies and the model that I'll describe a little bit later on in the talk has actually been the model that the state has used for that. And we have a whole variety of partners, um, in addition to the work in Bangladesh with Malaysia, China, Morocco, and Kenya, or some of the countries that we've worked with on very long term. And of course, those of you who are on campus as faculty, not as students, I don't want to know about any student parking irregularities. Um, but as you know that when you get one of these nice plaques, with or without a check, in my case it came without a check, which is too bad, um, <laughs> the more important thing that you get on this campus is parking. <laughs> and it's a big friendly parking space right in the middle of campus with a big NL on it for a Nobel laureate. And that is just about the pinnacle of life. 
Um, and I even know people who started to negotiate where their parkings, where the parking would be near their building, because um, they thought they might win the prize. And so we didn't have such grand aspirations. In fact, four of us on campus were faculty who contributed directly and received this plaque. Um, Kirk Smith, myself, Bill Collins, and Inez Fung were the four here were involved. And Berkeley spent 15 years, uh, sorry, uh, nine years trying to figure out how do they recognize this? And we were angling for that parking space, knowing <laughs> there was be no uh, no check was coming from the university. And in a very very Berkeley esque way, they figured out their solution. So anytime you walk by the Free Speech Movement Cafe, I recommend you stop by because they did give us the Nobel laureate parking space. However, they gave us <laughs> bicycle parking. <laughs> <laughs> and if you read the fine print, because Berkeley is all about the fine print, it does say parking not reserved for IPCC contributors, all cyclists welcome. So of the two times I've tried to go to use my parking space, it was all chained up with 9,000 bikes. And so didn't even get the value out of it. But you know, it speaks to Berkeley's uh, chaos and humor. And you can't beat that, right? So uh, there we go. Um, <coughs> Now you've been introduced to the laboratory, and um, I, again, I'm hoping that you talk to some of the students who are here who are in it as we go along. And now I really want to turn to the reason why I got to tell this great IPCC joke, and that is because while the IPCC produces reports every five years, and I've been working on this actually since right before I got to Berkeley, so quite a number of these five-year these five year, uh, sort of milestone reports, and we, talk, we tend to call them the door stoppers because they tend to be 1,000-page reports for which we get 1,000 comments per page for which we're legally required to respond to every comment, not just to say, that's a wonderful comment made by so-and-so and we'll save it for a subsequent paper, which is what academics do. In this case, you have to respond and demonstrate you make changes, and so there's a bit of work involved in doing this. And what's interesting is that these reports get a fair amount of attention, but what was just released a month ago was an off-cycle report. It was not one of these five-year assessments called the first assessment, the second, third, fourth, fifth, you get the idea. Um, this was a report on the impacts of changing, and I'm going to highlight changing in a second, from a global target of two degrees of warming for which we're not on a path to achieve, by the way, mm -hmm. to 1.5 degrees. And the politics of that, I'll get back to in a second, they relate directly to Bangladesh in a whole number of ways. But what's interesting is that finally an IPCC report didn't win the, uh, the, the, the nerdy land of Nobel Prize. It actually got the type of press for which this effort is designed for. And it's interesting, it wasn't one of these milestone reports. It was this 1.5 degree pathway. And that's something that emerged not before, but from the conversation in Paris around the Paris Climate Accords. I'll come back to that in a bit. That will lead into these other to uh, these topics I mentioned before, but let me first flesh this one out a little bit. So there's many, many aspects of the, the Bangladesh infrastructure story that are critical to think about, the incredibly important role it plays in manufacturing, particularly of garments, of, of, of garments and the impact in terms of a, a rapidly growing uh, economy. In fact, right now, Bangladesh is the fastest growing economy in Asia, which is something that experts in this room know. But I would argue that if you polled people, even experts on Asia, the majority would get this wrong. And it's a remarkable rate of growth. Last year was twice the rate of growth of China. And so it is an amazing number. And the Bangladesh grid has more than doubled in installed infrastructure. Um, in, in just seven years. And so the mix is largely dominated by gas. There's a very good gas resource, a domestic gas resource available. Fair amount of oil, which is dirtier, and diesel, which is, which is uh, dirtier still. And then very small amounts of hydro, coal um, imports, and then a small amount of solar. So it is a clean but fossil fuel based grid, but it's nowhere near clean enough to meet the climate target. And the climate target would be that two degrees, uh, no more than two degrees global warming, which means we only have, well, I'll say it the other way around, um, that two degree we should not exceed number is one where we globally have already used up half of that headroom. So we've already warmed the planet by one degree, leaving us one degree. And then there's two approaches. One is 
the affluent countries that largely caused the problem should be entirely or, or, or primarily responsible, or the countries that have the fastest growing energy economies and will dominate future pollution should make larger changes. And no surprise, the developed countries argue that those who are about to dominate the emissions profile, in fact, developing countries with complexities of how does China and India and others, are they listed as part of the story, um, the prior emitters say the emitters to come should make big changes. And the emitters to come say we didn't cause the problem. In fact, the industrial countries developed through a very fossil fuel intensive pathway, so they should make the first cuts. And they got rich on this. And so there was this interesting standoff that was very much in evidence until the Paris conference when a, a form of a breakthrough, at least a breakthrough on paper, happened. The problem is <coughs> that the impacts as we approach that two degree threshold will accrue most rapidly and most destructively to the poor. Now, I don't mean the poorest countries. I mean the poor in the north and the south. But given that there are essentially, by definition, more poor in the global south than the north, that is a version of impacts and damage will happen first and most strongly to those who are least able to adjust, at least in terms of financial resources. There are other resources that Bangladesh and many others have that we'll come back to in a bit. But this mixture is, again, clean for a dirty, but not clean overall. And because the emission reductions we will need on the global scale are 80% or more to meet the two degree goal, and more than that to meet the one and a half degree goal, and every tenth of a degree that we go over either of those has incredible in additional impacts. And just to highlight one that got a lot of press attention, the climate science says that if we hit our two degree goal, which five years ago people thought would be just miraculous to be able to uh, keep, emit, uh, keep global warming to only two degrees, two degrees we are guaranteed to lose 99% plus of all coral reefs, except for deep Arctic coral that none of us are dying to dive. There's a few people who want to do it. Most <laughs> of us are not keen on, 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 on diving there. And going to 1.5 degrees of target would actually mean that we would likely only destroy 75 to 80 percent of coral. And if you think that that all sounds horrific, it is. However, the ability to bounce back from killing essentially all coral goes basically to zero. It doesn't, it, it's not a rosy future if we meet only the one and a half degree. But only a few years ago, no one thought the one and a half degree target was possible. And that's actually a failing on the academics part. And I'll come back to that story in a little bit. As we think about the, uh, the implications of the one and a half degree target, the standard story about Bangladesh as essentially the lead country in terms of accruing benefits, if we can limit warming, comes into play. And so the, I mean, everyone here who has, has looked at Bangladesh has seen the, the, the tremendous amount of low-lying um, land and land, which has an incredible set of vulnerabilities for the communities, migrations, all kinds of interesting adaptations. And as we think about one meter sea level rise, which is essentially now guaranteed by 2100 if we don't make massive changes, that will essentially remove 25% of Bangladesh or more to the potential one and a half and even two, degree, uh, two meters of sea level rise if we do nothing will dramatically change the face of now, I believe, the sixth most populous country, uh, uh, populous country on the planet. And it gets scarier still. What's plotted down here in small, uh, what I'll just highlight, this is a map of drinking water vulnerability for key coastal settlements and number of places are are in trouble, but Bangladesh essentially collects more of the, uh, the dangerous red dots of huge impacts on, on fresh water because of saltwater intrusion if we don't make an impact. And so even if we did no more dive into the climate change story than that, it is clear that the climate change impacts for which the 1.5 degree or less warming effort is designed to impact will arguably impact Bangladesh more strongly and more violently than almost any other country. Um, and of course, we're talking more than one out of 10 Bangladeshis are directly in harm's way today. And that's even before any discussion of population growth and other features. So it is critically on the front lines of the story. Um, 
and I will I'll be talking about the, um, uh, <coughs> the the plan for expansion of the Bangladeshi generation mix. Right now, the plan is essentially to go from that 12 or 13 gigawatts, 10 to the ninth watts of installed capacity, to basically double that uh, by 2030, which is a, a huge order. And ironically, to me, to essentially double it by doubling down on coal. And see, coal is a small, a very a minimal bit of mix today, but the plan is to start off with a series of coal plants, including, most controversially, the Rampal plant, which is ironically in the Sundarbans, which could not be more bizarre on just a whole variety of levels. You can argue that even though there's been a really active social movement to protest it, the fact that few people live there and tigers don't vote. There is a real, there is a whole variety of arguments why politically that is a good choice if you want to do something that's destructive. As much as we all say we care about tigers, um, few people will be there recording pictures and looking at the damages. But it's an incredibly crazy plan, given that not only will this, will this plan be then part of a wave of coal, but also, this coal isn't even indigenous. This is actually imported coal. So this would be coming from the global coal communities, coming from Kalimantan, Indonesia, coming from Australia and elsewhere, as imports, hurting the balance of payments. And as you'll see in a bit, we now have ample evidence that there is a much cleaner path, but there are a whole variety of forces arrayed against that. That's just the climate, the IPCC story, just to sort of put it in the slide deck for those who want it, but I, I've summarized that. The challenge of this process of cutting off this warming pathway and being on the 1.5 degree and not the 2 or 3 or more degree pathway is one where the academic community has not done its job. Going into Paris, lots of modeling groups, my own included, had not put this 1.5 degree scenario in their modeling efforts. And the reasons for that are varied, but they basically boil down to the fact that five or more years ago, no one was taking seriously the chance that we could even think about one and a half or two degrees. And there are some skeptics who think we still can't. But that's no excuse for the modeling community. If you know the impacts of going from uh, two degrees to 1.5 to even lower are as dramatic as preserving some coral or no coral, that is a feature for which it's just irresponsible to have not been far out in front. But a level of intellectual cowardliness by all of us contributed to going into the Paris meeting not being prepared to argue for this deeper level of cuts. And as you look at the impacts, there has been beautiful graph after graph that highlight the amount of flooding. And since the largest mangrove swamps in the world are in Bangladesh, the fact that going from two degrees to one and a half degrees dramatically reduces the number of these risks is something that we should have been far more anticipatory about. The other feature that will connect to the second uh, part of the talk is that finally one of these international reports actually read documents written by another agency under the same hat. And that is the IPCC is a UN agency, and the UN has of course also been busy at work generating what I used to call the feel-good metrics. Um, the sustainable development goals, because who wouldn't be against lower poverty and more food availability and this and that? They all sound great um, until you actually have to spend money on them when they apparently don't sound as great. But one of the really interesting features that came out in this report is to look at all 17 of the sustainable development goals, including my own personal little backyard, which is sustainable goal number seven, which is clean energy um, here, and to highlight how much of an impact and how many synergies. So this is a table of <coughs> levels of confidence in synergies and in um, and trade-offs that exist by meeting or not meeting each of the goals. And in fact, what you find if you really dig into this is that investing in clean energy and resilient infrastructure enables almost everything else. Better food systems, education, gender parity, there's a whole variety of things. And not to say that the world is run by hardware and physical technology, but in terms of the map of positive impacts. If you address those two, you don't solve the others, but you open up the opportunity to get there. And this is actually, I think, the most interesting feature of this IPCC report, for which don't read the whole 900 pages. You can read the 12-page executive summary um, and get kind of dig into exactly these numbers. Now, that brings us back to what I highlighted before, 
the pre-Paris pathway was the red line, the so-called business as usual, or I used to call the Bush as usual when that was insulting, but now we think of Bush as good relative to certain <laughs> other creatures. Um, and so that was the path we thought we were on. The Paris Accords, a series of voluntary accords that for the first time were not a classic uh, political science negotiation where everyone essentially agreed to do the same thing at the same time meant that countries arrived at Paris, each proposing their own little wedge of the pink. Some countries said we're going to go all in on energy efficiency. Others develop renewable energy. Others were going to protect mangroves. Others peat forests. Others swamps. Everyone said what they would do so that their national emissions would stay under the two degree number and all added up they shaved or they would shave a degree off the first meeting where countries have to report how they've done on that target is this December in Poland. Um, and because the weather won't be so nice, everyone will have to stay inside and work, unlike Paris, where we all sat outside. Um, <laughs> and that wedge of pink is what countries have committed to do. And then the Paris meeting was so happy that everyone quickly signed a second accord, the so-called Kigali Accords, the yellow, largely around refrigerants cutting off another half degree, still leaving a full additional degree we need to do. But overnight, people had committed to this. And now I hope you can see why the international community was so ill-prepared to have assessments ready of what it would take to go to one and a half degrees. Because not only were we thinking about four and five and six, and so one and a half sounded crazy and radical, which is supposed to be what academics do, um, but two degrees would bring our emissions numbers very close to zero, which of course means one and a half would bring them to negative territory. And nobody really knows what negative territory means. Um, it means not only no more emissions or no more net emissions, but it also means we are sucking carbon out of the atmospheric system. And the speed at which we get there is essentially a reverse of how quickly we ramped up. And then since we want to be there by mid-century to stave off these damages, we have various scary curves where basically every year for the rest of certainly my lifetime, we will have to be making rates of improvement that we have not seen even for more than two or three years. So it is a challenging recipe, um, but it's one that highlights not only this turning over, but the different scenarios all mean we go negative. And this is yet another place where Bangladesh becomes a place on the forefront of this process. Because essentially, there are two flavors of negative emissions. One is we do various geoengineering. We put mirrors in space, or as one colleague of mine, I guess no longer a colleague, proposed, we wrap ice, uh, we, we, we wrap glaciers in aluminum foil to reflect sunlight back. Um, these various extreme measures I'm not a huge fan of, but there are two very simple ones. One is we invest in natural systems that already absorb carbon. One are land-based systems where we can absorb quite amount by better soils, but in fact, the place where we know where we can absorb carbon more effectively are coastal and marine systems. And the mangrove swamps are actually one of the most ideal places. And so not only do we know we need to go negative at some point, but if we don't want to start tinkering um, and engineering the Earth system, of which some of my colleagues unfortunately want to do, um, that the reinvesting in the types of, of situations where rainforest dominated countries and those countries with incredibly critical um, intertidal areas like Bangladesh are primed to make a big difference on. So that leads to the first very specific part of the story into the op-ed that you all have. Um, this came out of an effort that Samira largely orchestrated a Con a, a dialogue and a conversation with Samil Hook and his organization in Dhaka, which has been a critical player in both climate change research and critically, climate adaptation. And climate adaptation is a part of the story which in essentially every Western university, including Berkeley, gets short shrift. The idea is that we should cut emissions. That's what I'm going to talk about. That's primarily what I do. But the much more challenging area, the one that we know even if we make this one and a half degree path work, which is very uh, very doubtful given today's rate, is we are going to have to adapt to a certain amount, probably a large amount of climate change. 
And that's going to mean changing agriculture, changing living patterns, changing how we, how we treat forests, changing how we drive, a whole variety of features. And on all of these fronts, fast-growing, poor economies like Bangladesh, even though it's rich on the global scale, are going to be in the lead in that process. And so we, uh, um, Samir and I, were on an extended uh, trip in, uh, in, in February of this year to basically make the case for that. And the tool that we used is part of a package um, that we built here at Berkeley initially to study the energy economy of California, but because California is not a power island, we may be the Republic of California, but we do trade with our neighbors. And so we built a model called Switch of the Western region. We then built this model, which is a model of the energy system. So it doesn't talk about trade and goods. It's electricity and increasingly transportation as we electrify it. And so we then built versions for Chile and for Nicaragua, largely due to funding availability, um, and for Kenya, uh, for Kosovo, for China. And, uh, and then we, we approached the point where we had this opportunity to really engage on the Bangladeshi story. And so Kenji led an effort, which is the precursor to build a detailed model of the power grid. And that is to map resources and to make sure everyone involved in the conversation is aware just from how dramatically, quickly, the prices are changing for everything. For nuclear, for coal, for hydro, for gas, for solar, and to put that in front of everyone involved in the conversation in a transparent way. And so we used a model that um, some of our grad students and a colleague in Erg Duncan Calloway and I uh, managed. Um, the first two students were the were the with the key members, Grace Wu and Ranji Deshmukh, and they are they have now both moved to UC Santa Barbara, where I think they are recreating our department um, in the southern part of the state. Um, and this is essentially a mapping model. And Kenji led the effort to develop this as an open source tool for Bangladesh, which we then used to map the energy resources available in country in terms of wind, solar, biomass, and other features. And of course, everyone who's worked in Bangladesh knows that the dialogue around distributed energy sources, not necessarily coal, is largely one of incredible land uh, challenges about land use because of how densely populated the country is and how critical it is to maintain um, sufficient indigenous agriculture. And so we did this mapping exercise largely based around excluding land that we would like to use for clean energy if all land was available, but it's not. So constraining that in ways that we would have the minimal land impact to have minimal impacts on village communities and on agriculture and on natural areas that we actually want to preserve in um, this overall process. And then we went through a, a resource mapping exercise. We went through an economic mapping that you can't do until you have a resource mapping. And the idea is to, even if sides massively disagree, to make it that they are all at least talking from the same numbers. And that is the arguably the biggest challenge in this process. Because the prices of renewable energy have changed so dramatically that even very much in the know executives in government offices and private sector companies are often arguing for different technologies with whatever background motivation you think they might have, i.e. investments or contracts or kickbacks or whatever they might be anywhere in the world, but at least talking about the same numbers. And what was interesting about the, the study in Bangladesh is that while land use is at a premium, the amount of land available in ways that would allow you to essentially replace the coal investment with renewables was one that wasn't even much of a challenge to identify land areas, be it on the outskirts of small communities, be it in areas that were degraded already. This is not a challenge to meet that 13 gigawatts that proposed massive increase in coal, doubling national capacity with coal, we found that with a little bit of wind, one gigawatt of wind, and 12 or more gigawatts of solar, entirely possible. Now the details of this are something that I would of course love to spend all the time on here, but since they're both in the, in the paper that we highlight and I have basically summarized all of the details of them, um, that what we found is that meeting all of that proposed demand for um, a source of coal with solar would be 20% cheaper. And that 20% difference 
is more than enough to cover what we believe the cost of solar plus wind, solar or wind plus energy storage will be in five years. Now, I, I constructed that statement specifically that way because this is where reasonable people can have a disagreement. I did not say that solar plus storage today was cheaper than building coal. We forecast that within about five years, solar plus storage or wind plus storage will be cheaper than coal. And because it's going to take much more than five years to double the size of Bangladesh installed capacity, and we don't need storage for the first few gigawatts we add, that's an equation that makes this story happen. Now, we wrote this paper almost a year ago and then put it through the, uh, the peer review process. It's now accepted in a journal called Applied Energy, which is quite a good fit for it. But a few interesting things have happened since we submitted and got it, uh, and got it accepted. The first one is this IPCC report I mentioned. And the second one is that the primary funder of large international coal projects used to be the World Bank. You can argue now it's China, and we will come back to that in conversation. But I want to play 20 seconds of the recent high-level dialogue, an interview of Jim Kim, the president of the World Bank, by Christine Lagarde, who you actually used to occupy the office down the hall from me at the World Bank until she moved over to the National Monetary Fund. And I'll just play those 20 seconds, assuming I got the volume right, which I think I did. Great. So on the Balkans, yes, we have uh, made a very firm decision not to go forward with coal power plant because we are required by our bylaws to go with the lowest cost option, and renewables have now come below. Now, there's a couple interesting things in that 20 seconds. One, he did mention the Balkans, not Bangladesh, because the Bangladesh power plant is actually not funded by the World Bank. It is funded by a truly bizarre, I guess I shouldn't say really bizarre, by a bizarrely titled Bangladeshi Indian consortium called the Happiness Energy Coalition <laughs> to invest in um, these projects. And so Kit, Jim did not talk about this project because they are not the chief funder. But he highlighted that the World Bank, that some of us might naively think, has other criteria than just least cost. You can argue that a group based on, I mean, when you walk into the World Bank's office, I assume you've all done that at least once, or you should, because the cafeteria downstairs is both really good and really subsidized. Um, but there's a big sign on the wall, which I walked in for every day for a year when I worked there, and I could never understand the big sign. Some of you know it, and it says, our <laughs> Our dream is a world free of poverty. I would have thought the World Bank, the UN agency, it wouldn't be their dream. It would be their mission or their action or some effing real thing as opposed to their dream, right? I mean, it's a little bizarre. That's their job. And you heard, unfortunately, Jim Kim just back up that weak-minded uh, perspective by saying not we have chosen no longer to invest in coal, because we have decided that the social benefits of job creation in other sectors or the inequities where coal projects, when done in developing countries, primarily fund industry, not poor people. There's a whole variety of legitimate arguments. Or he could have said, no, we choose to invest in coal, even though it's not the cheapest, because we feel it can be done more quickly, which is false, or with more controllable cost, which is false or some other argument. He could have made an argument in Fortical. He didn't. He said a classic banker argument, which is last time I checked, even though it's called the World Bank. We all know <laughs> that the bank is a fund, and the fund is a bank, right? That's lesson number one in Geography 10, right? Um, and so he made this bizarrely simplistic argument around cost, whereas last time I checked, that's actually not the World Bank's charter. But given that it is, what he is saying is that even the World Bank, is going to move to this to this new perspective. And of course, I haven't bored you anything with discussions of externalities and what the pollution ban what the pollution damages might be globally or locally or any of all that little minor stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Just the basic argument. Um, we find it's cheaper even when you include storage, which we don't need right away. 
And this mixture of mainly solar and wind is a good match to the relatively poor um, wind resource available on shore in Bangladesh. It doesn't actually get into where the frontier of wind power globally actually is, which is offshore. And in fact, Bay of Bengal is not so bad for that. So there's a bunch of interesting features. And distributed urban solar could meet almost 20% of overall demand. And every time you go from large distribute a large centralized power plants, be they coal or solar, and start distributing the energy more locally, you get a more resilient, robust, and locally adaptable system. So there's a whole bunch of interesting features um, that are tied into this work. So this already tells you a story. And for those who want to say, well, big international projects, they generally tend to gobble up the best land because they want the projects to work the best. So let's say you even thought that, and maybe there is going to be a conflict, a conflict with food, even though there doesn't need to be, because often private sector won't do things in the best way. <coughs> the current big trend in solar is transparent solar. And so we're talking about buildings. We are talking about rural um, setups that use everything from, from um, non-flexible to flexible versions of solar at very low cost that do not even impact agricultural or other areas. If you want to interleave solar rays with crop fields, which we're already seeing in Brazil until the new president decides that they have to go. Um, but there is a whole range of technological options that even make the potential small amount of conflict uh, over land a non-issue. So we have a story that wins over and over again economically, but as we all know, that's not the whole story. And if you really want to come full circle on the degree to which Bangladesh is, in fact, the ground zero country for demonstrating that we can develop in a way that will allow us to meet not only the large scale energy needs, but the distributed ones, it is the story of Samira receiving flowers at lectures. Um, this was at North South University um, for the kind of work that she is now doing on how do we think about the rights of stateless people and the Rohingya could not be more stateless for the whole variety of reasons, and both to try to meet their energy needs, but do so in a way that would allow Myanmar and Bangladesh to come to some face savings on all sides agreements. And um, in fact, just last week, Samira led a uh, laboratory lunch meeting. I think it was the most attended lab lunch we've had all year, because if no other reason, this is truly a topic where we're not just talking about substituting dirty energy for clean energy. We're talking about a whole number of social amplification features that change the dialogue around what renewable energy can provide. And so kind of the, the iconic pictures of refugees fleeing an area where the Myanmar army behind them is burning the, their, uh, the, the, their communities in Rakhine State and moving overnight to create massive refugee populations and creating what are absolutely phenomenal, the fast and uh, problematic cities in a um, you know, million people overnight as encampments turned into cities. This gives the third point where the Bangladesh story, and I'll say now the Bangladesh Myanmar story, is really one of the climate story we expect to see coming. Because climate refugees, which are already an issue, are going to grow dramatically. <coughs> no matter how many inches or centimeters or meters of coastal area in Bangladesh or Nicaragua or Florida we lose, climate refugees are going to become the norm. And for the next several decades, we are going to see more and more of this in story. And so what Samira is working on is essentially how can we not only work and educate the leaders of these projects to find ways to replace dirty fossil energy in these communities, which are underemployed and oversitting around in a variety of ways, and will ultimately take the technology lessons back when they move back. Of course, we all know that refugee communities, which we think of as temporary, have an average worldwide lifespan of 29 years each, so often they last for a long time. But this is the type of challenge we are going to face to an increasing degree. And the more you can build in energy <coughs> resilience partnerships around <coughs> quick to install distributed options that does not describe any fossil fuel technology we have today but it does describe small modular solar wind 
biomass in camps like this, running <coughs> energy off of human and animal waste to make energy or all variety of part and parcel of this kind of mix of opportunities, and to think about the opportunity to bring down what is all is a human suffering, b environmental damage in areas for the most affected populations. And those of you who were at the Rohingya session just a few weeks ago saw saw, saw, saw Samira talk through a bit of this as well. Now, yesterday's news was there is a deal that has been brokered. It's kind of an odd deal because uh, it is between the two governments, which sounds good, except for that the UN, which actually basically manages in a very piecemeal and patchwork way um, the camps, has actually been left out of this conversation, which makes very little sense. But this is the time to find how much can these communities, if they do fully go back or in part, can take back with them the lessons about how clean energy systems will allow them to think very differently about their futures, to really change this from this, you know, this, this poverty encampment to one that is building the lessons for the energy systems that we absolutely know we are going to need to have to move to. And that leads me to the end, which is a remarkably <coughs> simple set of recommendations. You don't normally get ones that kind of fall out this easily. I'm going to skip the California bit. I'm not sure why I put that in there. Um, and that is the following. We already know there is extreme vulnerability. I've tried to make that case throughout. Making what we do and what Bangladesh does a critical part of the story. And that the Rohingya camps and the poverty and the lack of coordination around the, um, the, the, the infrastructure for these communities is critical. But we, we already have on the table a series of investors that had planned to plunk down billions of dollars to build these 13 gigawatts of coal energy which presumably they will need to move away from if the pressure remains on. However, the real challenge at this moment is to say you investors, your happiness uh, coalition of Bangladeshi and Indian investors or the World Bank, whoever it may be, the challenge is not to say, well, we were going to do coal here, but now we walk away. The challenge now is to hold them to the same level of investment but a better financial deal, because we've already seen in this case the clean energy option is cheaper than the fossil option, which means their rate of return should be higher on these projects. And so there is a very, very simple issue about positive investing of these projects, which is a critical part of the story, and that's really why thinking through this infrastructure challenge for Bangladesh is really thinking through how we're going to deal with what is going to be the norm for the next 30 years. So thank you all for the patience just this time of day, and thank the Chagri Center and the show. I have a small question. Uh, how much land do you need for generation of one gigawatt uh, energy? Is it in square mile? Yeah, so it depends on which technology that you're going for. Mm -hmm. And Kenji, do you have that number for Bangladesh in front of you? Because I have it for... <laughs> so the issue is that as a, as, as, as a tropical country, they're somewhat less available than we think about some of the desert conditions. Um, yeah, but we get very really high right. quality incident. You, you do, yeah. but there's also, a, there's also a seasonal issue. Yeah. So the, the rule of thumb that I would use here so what we calculated yeah. is that to meet that 13 gigawatt yeah. number, Bangladesh would need to devote about 2% of land area, of 2% of arable land area for that purpose. And that is, that is roughly 20% more than the land area that would be <laughs> devoted if one did a gas intensive in terms of pipelines and storage tanks. So it's remarkably small addition to get rid of, of of the sort of trailing impact of the uh, of the natural gas system, but I'm sort of pausing while Kenji pulls the the number up in square kilometers. Uh, yeah. Um, so um, about point four percent of Bangladesh land is enough for thirteen gigawatts. So about percent. Yeah, like um, two percent will be one thousand square mile. And one percent will be five thousand. Right. So this is this is so 0.4, So half of that. Okay. I mean, again, I, to me, the figure of merit is not the total land area. Yeah. It's relative to a gas intensive, and this twenty percent difference, I would argue, is remarkably small um, for that uh, to meet that. Go ahead. So, um, how do you get 
you know, the greater population involved in the effort <coughs> to move towards clean energy. Mm. Like, how do you begin the process of like educating the community why they need that shift, right. and just like making sure they understand what's happening around right. them. So this, in some ways, gets back to your question about land area and impacts and who benefits and who and who doesn't in the process. So we've been involved in a series of these battles over coal in Kenya, in Malaysia, um, <coughs> Bangladesh, and elsewhere. And I would say the biggest feature is not solving the issue of different uh, motivations and who's invested in coal and who's invested in renewables and whatever else but in making that everyone talks from the same basic numbers. Right? It's a fallacy to think that the policymaker kind of nerds dream where we all sit down and do a cost benefit and have some sense of it. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that as we think through what are the relative impacts, it's a very difficult story if people aren't on a basic page in terms of land area, jobs, capital investment, long-term investment. And the biggest challenge for renewables is not the land area. In almost every country, Bangladesh is one of the extreme ones where counting square kilometers ends up being a story. And it's not jobs because it's widely, I mean, the science says, and there's, there's not much debate anymore, that renewable energy gives you more jobs per dollar invested than does fossil. But the issue is the lumpiness of capital. And the problem is that in renewable energy projects, even if their 20-year NPV value, their, their, their lifetime ener average energy costs are comparable or cheaper, as I showed here, you have to install them. Which means if you don't have financing for the project over those 20 years, even if it's cheaper in the long term, it looks more expensive to bankers, hence it looks riskier. And so the biggest challenge to make this transition is to figure out country by country, municipality, where will the upfront lump sum financing come from? And that's a point where very reasonable people can disagree. In some countries, it's going back to the World Bank or the IMF or others. In others, it's going to be going on private investors. And that's a point where if you say, yes, we'd like to do this, but unless the international community or someone is willing to front us a certain amount or to guarantee a particularly low interest rate, we might like to do it, we know it's cheaper, but we still choose not to. And that's a place where I think reasonable people can disagree, but you can't get there unless the basic numbers are in front of all players. I had a question. Yeah. Yeah, I happen to have visited the Dutch government mm -hmm. uh, sponsored land reclamation project where they started to yep. uh, install actually solar, solar panels 25 years ago for the notification, you know, emergency notification. Right. Seems to have backfired. <coughs> there, there have been some positive stuff happening, but it's backfired. They had tried to do some small scale wind turbines. Yep. Didn't work. Yep. And I asked some folks out there, and they mentioned that there's no wind pattern recorded, and they're not very consistent. Yep. And I was wondering if you guys have taken into account the tidal. Uh, uh, the, 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 you know, because Bangladesh and, yep. and part of India, that. you know, a lot of countries are now uh, exploring the title. Yep. So let me start for the wind and then go to the title. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. Um, the, the solar resource, as you highlighted before, is pretty good nationwide, and so it's a pretty easy one. The wind resource that meets all of the criteria of not impacting agriculture, not impacting mm -hmm. lands, is very limited. Mm -hmm. A gigawatt of wind, however, 20 years ago was a big investment in terms of land, in terms of turbines. It's now become actually quite small. We observe projects around the world, such as Altamont <coughs> Pass right here, where 100 turbines get removed, replaced by one, and you get more output out of the one than the 100 you took out. So there is a remarkable feature. But the wind resource that would make sense to start with is very small and very localized. So that's one feature of the story. We did not include any significant investment in, in tidal energy. Not that it's not possible there, but because one of the other tenement, the tenants, and one that I agree with more than some other aspects of the World Bank, is not to do a develop, not to do a research project with development dollars. And the issue here is that 
with the um, with the monsoon, there is no tested off-the-shelf technology that would make sense today without any R&D. Not that we couldn't do it, but there is not companies ready to install that technology in this context. And so, because we don't need it to meet the total, we, pr we presented a scenario without it. But that doesn't mean it can't be one of the next waves of these things. And in fact, there are a number of tidal projects going in around the world, none that I'm aware of right now in Bangladesh. Yeah. Um, so I would argue that's a phase two. And because no one's gonna pay for 13 gigawatts well, 12 gigawatts of solar and one gigawatt of wind overnight, it will be staged anyway. And so the opportunity to build in these potentially important but likely smaller pieces would come later on in the story. I mean, Kenji, if you want to amplify or disagree on, on that assessment. Um, I would agree. Okay. <laughs> I just got one more thing to sure. say. I have, I have a friend, actually, it's a common friend for some of us here. Um, he worked for Southern California Edison. Mm -hmm. He's right now in Bangladesh. And he said the Germans are actually doing some projects. And solar is actually, there's a lot of movement towards solar, but we are more concerned and more worried about coal and nuclear, which yeah. seems to be something that's being pushed. Even though nuclear is argu arguably a, cl a cleaner form of energy source, but you know right. whether the country can manage it. Right. So I would argue that, that it, it simply doesn't make sense to do coal. And no matter how much you want to chase the line of vested interests and in companies that have paid off legally or not people to be invested, the coal argument is just not work relative to either a renewable plus storage. Nuclear is a different story. And nuclear is a much larger conversation. It depends on one's risk tolerance. It depends much more on this capital issue. but. Of the countries that might make sense for nuclear, I don't think you can discount it that quickly in Bangladesh, given the population density. And if you were to build in some nuclear, it is a place where it would make sense. However, as I said in an earlier lecture today, nuclear is in a challenging position. So even if you think there is no risk of nuclear accidents, which of course is impossible. But even if you say the next generation will be so much massively safer, the challenge is that nuclear plants as they exist today are not economic. And I don't mean they don't have a price point that would make sense. What I mean is that unless you want to structure your entire energy economy around nuclear, they don't make sense as an add-on to a system okay. because they come with very high costs. And there's today's plants, not the plants that Bill Gates might want in 10 years. They're so inflexible mm -hmm. that you would have to organize what you do elsewhere around the nuclear. And this, in the case of Bangladesh, that has no nuclear today, would literally be the tail wagging the dog. And it's worse. So I just came back from a, a trip to Jordan, number one recipient of US aid, actually now more than Israel. Interesting factoid on this. And Jordan has requested the permit to build two nuclear plants. And the Jordan story is entirely re relevant for Bangladesh. What you need is a small cadre of very highly educated individuals Check for Jordan, check for Bangladesh. We can both do that. However, if you do not have currently installed nuclear capacity, the International um, Nuclear Energy Regular Agency will not let you simply build a plant. They require you to also build a test and training reactor so that your citizens or those you might import Jordan has chosen to import a number of Iraqis to run their system, which is already interesting. Um, you have to have a research reactor before you can qualify to build a commercial reactor because there must be in-country expertise and training facilities around accidents. And what that means is that even if nuclear was the cost of solar, and today nuclear is at least 10 times more expensive than solar, 
that additional capacity would both be a long delay and would be a large additional expense that is not part of the equation. So essentially, we have an odd situation where even if nuclear works, it can only go into countries that already have nuclear. Unless they want to step out of the International Nuclear Energy Regulatory Agency, for which a country like Bangladesh could not make that choice. North Korea can make that choice, a few other rogue nations can make that choice, but that would not be possible for Bangladesh because its reactors would come from China, Japan, or Korea. And from Russia. Russia. <laughs> well, but the Russian, so the Russian case is interesting because yeah. that's what Jordan proposed. Yeah. And the international energy is blocked it. Yeah, but the thing is, Bangladesh has already got a contract with Russia. So, you know, so I, what I would say is caveat emptor. Yeah, I know. Right? You buy a reactor from Russia. Yeah. Right? I think there's a pressure. Uh, yeah. the gas is depleting. So yep. Yeah. Can I just see if there are any more questions? Absolutely. Yes. Please, sir. Yeah. What criteria do the World Bank look at when they decide what sort of <laughs> projects to fund? And are they operating in parallel to these sort of hard path options and sort of soft path rural electrification efforts in Bangladesh? And if so, what's sort of the order of magnitude comparison between them? Right. So just to be clear, the coal investments in Bangladesh would not have World Bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, soft paths, so sold and distributed solar and wind would, but the funding levels are nowhere at the scale of the billions that have proposed for the coal plants. And so small distributed energy projects with international funding would almost <coughs> certainly go ahead whether they do the coal or not. But the World Bank's own criteria until this announcement two weeks ago would not play into a decision if they had been an investor in coal. Their coal investment, again, comes from this uh, private sector with, with some government money uh, as well, but this, this Indian Bangladeshi piece. And so these are essentially conversations that are not interacting. So I know it's a very unsatisfying answer, but that's the dynamics of these projects today in Bangladesh. Excuse me. Yeah. Could I just ask if there are any other questions from the back? Please. Okay. Um, First, uh, solar system always wins. There's no doubt. Only on price, yeah. uh -huh. not on political back, just to be clear. Yeah, right? that I understand. Okay. So from scientist community and right. the, the people with reason, they will do, do that. The major problem with the uh, infrastructure cost and also most of the, uh, for because we, in Bangladesh we don't uh, manufacture the solar panels, right. we import. Right. So basically we are dependent on importing. Right. Um, is Bangladesh, is it possible for Bangladesh to manufacture those things and no. So mm -hmm. ten years ago the answer was no. Mm -hmm. Now solar manufacturing has gone away from ultra clean room, incredibly pure materials mm -hmm. to essentially what we used to call roll to roll film when film was a thing. <laughs> um, camera film I mean. So the manufacturing costs are low, mm -hmm. but they would have to be licensed. There is no indigenous solar <coughs> manufacturing industry in Bangladesh today. Um, North South University has talked about it. There's a couple groups that would like to be in the lead of that, but they would need to get funding. And so that's, that's why this kind of policy recommendation of we need to hold the companies to a positive investing in energy systems, even if the coal projects for which you know, they were invested in the past doesn't work out. So it's, it's very possible, but the challenge is you would need to then match up these investors and then you would want to scale. A um, couple countries have done so. Brazil went from zero indigenous manufacturing of solar to having a solar industry that they can install in only a few years. Ethiopia has just gone over that hurdle with a large chunk of, of Italian aid to get the startup companies going. For us, we small amounts, but it's certainly possible. So that would be a perfect example of how you could do this kind of positive investment. Yes? Were the conditions for offshore wind unfavorable, or was it not explored for the mm. same reason that yeah, you wouldn't want to put development dollars into a research project? Mm. Yeah, so actually, three, four years ago, wind wa offshore wind was really only being done at the leading edge wind countries, meaning Denmark, France, UK, Ireland. Offshore wind has now become the norm, 
And interestingly enough, while it's a little bit more expensive, A, your sighting costs drop dramatically because whales don't vote, um, and because the technology has gone from huge piers to floating tethered systems that actually may sound kind of you know, not, not as, they're actually much more resilient to monsoons and other events. They can furl much more into the whole variety of features. And so we only didn't include it because the offshore wind maps and the projections are not good enough to do it yet. But again, because any of these investments would be staged, you could quite easily put that into the mix. Um, my suspicion is, well, I'll, I'll leave my suspicion uh, for later on, but it seems that this would, this would not be a bad match <coughs> as kind of not phase one where I would do the onshore wind and solar storage, but a phase two of the process. Oh, this is not a peer-reviewed journal. What's your suspicion? <laughs> my suspicion is that what you're going to get is a challenge where the ideal areas to do offshore wind are going to be in the Sundarbans. <laughs> <laughs> um, and while I don't think that you know, the wildlife would not suffer by wind turbines particularly, it would be ironic if you end up trying to make a case that you were going to replace doing onshore coal in the Sundarbans with offshore wind. I could see the optics of that being challenging, but um, you know, it's a workable piece. That means turbines has to be able to piece. Yeah, these are, so we're talking turbines that are hundreds of meters tall. These are massive, five to seven megawatts per turbine. And in fact, some, if you go back to the tidal energy question, the really interesting feature is that a offshore wind turbine is a wind turbine that sticks 200 meters plus into the air, is tethered to the ocean floor, and has a massive block of concrete as the ballast underwater, well, guess what? That massive block of concrete could be replaced by underwater turbines. And the benefit is that the wind regime and the wave regime, everywhere we've studied, are uncorrelated. So you get wind on one part, you're getting this, and so that's a really interesting dual-use technology um, that is now being looked at by the biggest investors in this space, which are the big Norwegian infrastructure firms that want to sell these all over Western Europe. Let's take a last question yeah. from here. So, do you or maybe like I can in Dhaka, like have any plans to communicate these results with Ministry of uh, Power, Energy, and Minerals in Bangladesh? Yeah. So, um, our partner, like uh, uh, ICAD, are they are the orchestrators of a government dialogue. And so when we were there last time, and when we go back in January um, this year, they actually, and I don't quite, maybe Samira can, uh, can explain it more clearly than I, I was surprised to see an inside the ministry process entirely managed by an NGO. And maybe this is Samir's, uh, Samira, do you want to you highlight how they manage this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that's the way the key players usually work in Bangladesh. So we will do another version of exactly what you said in January. It is not something that is part of the US political system, right? As much as certain environmental groups, NRDC and others, have a big say on Capitol Hill, they do not run hearings inside the Capitol, and that's exactly what ICAD does in Bangladesh. And so it gives you a really amazing front door, which also is why I started the talk by saying this would not be possible without mm -hmm. the real muscle in the room are the local teams, right? We come in and assist and partner and demonstrate that we will be there through the process. 
but they're doing the heavy lifting, and this is that's the heaviest of lifting. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So with that, yeah, let me please invite all of you to enjoy some wine and cheese on behalf of the Shabir and Malini Chaudhary Center. Thank you all for coming, but most of all, thank you, Dan, oh, for a really rich.